So I needed something more than just theory, and I think it was dark matter, and the fact that supersymmetry predicted a candidate for dark matter. So uh, that's what I've been looking for, is that dark matter candidate at the LHC, and we have ruled out almost everything we could possibly look for, I mean, uh, in this simpler, more beautiful supersymmetry model. Now we're looking at less beautiful supersymmetry models. Hi, this is Dr. Jed Macasco at Wake Forest University and Academic Influence. And today we have with us Professor Joe Incandela from uh, out in the West Coast, pro uh, professor uh, of physics at UC Santa Barbara and uh, uh, somebody who does a lot of different things. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, how did you get into physics? So it was interesting because my family, uh, it was very artistically oriented and I studied art at the Art Institute of Chicago every Saturday from when I was six until I was 18 and planned to become an artist. Studied all kinds of art and um, got very interested in glass sculpture and my favorite sculptor was a chemist and I decided I needed to study chemistry and, and went into chemistry and discovered physics. That's usually the story I give. But actually, the more I thought about it, I realized that actually, uh, from when I was very little, I had thought a lot about like space time and the universe and I was very deeply interested in that. And I didn't discover until I was a, I took my first physics course that there was a, there was a discipline that actually studied those things that, you know, that that was one could get a real job doing that, you know? And I think, uh, when I, at, at the end of my first, uh, physics course, I, I remember I was 18. I decided I was going to get a PhD in physics, and uh, wow. that's what I did. Yeah. So not not everybody who comes to our website will have uh, thought things as through as carefully, but it's good for them to get to hear your backstory. Um, mm -hmm. And then, how is it that you ended up where you are right now? Can you guide us through sort of your uh, trajectory to Santa Barbara? Yeah, I I, uh, I went into physics. I I had originally wanted to do theoretical physics because I really didn't like lab courses as a, an undergrad. <clears throat> but then um, when I got into grad school, presumably to do theoretical physics, um, an experimentalist asked me to try experimental one summer. And I discovered that actually doing experimental physics is completely different than lab courses. And um, I really like the combination of, you know, understanding the physics and the theory, um, but but actually connecting more with the data, and seeing seeing the physics itself, and and you know the variety of things you did, where you worked with engineers, you built things, you analyzed data, you had to become somewhat somewhat of a jack of all trades, and and my thesis experiment was the search for magnetic monopoles, which using superconducting detectors. I don't know if you know, but I mean, in, in 1982 or 83, there was a candidate event with a superconducting detector at Stanford that really kind of lit the world on fire. It looked like it had to be a monopole. It was exactly what you'd expect. So my experiment basically was uh, 200 times the scale of that. And we didn't see anything, but we did show that there was a singles rate and we had coincident loops. And we basically killed the the the, the party, so to speak, we kind of... We're, we're, but um, but I then wanted to go into more standard particle physics with accelerators, and I did a kind of a stint for ten months on a kind of an in between experiment with an underground experiment at the Grand Sasso mine in Italy, uh, which used standard equipment but was still looking for monopoles and cosmic rays, and then I got a CERN fellowship, and I joined the UA two experiment shortly after they discovered the W and Z particle and. And ever since then, I've been trying, I, and I, I worked very hard to, to be, I, I really wanted to be part of, having joined this experiment with people who had just been part of a major discovery made me really want to be part of a major discovery. And um, so I focused on that for a while. I chased after the top quark in Europe and then moved back to the U.S. to look for that. And I led the team that actually had the strongest signature uh, signal for the discovery of the top quark. And I did that with silicon detectors, semiconductor detectors, which you can do very high precision tracking. You can detect the B quarks coming from the top quark decay by their long lived pathways, because you can project the particle tracks back with such precision that you can see that the 
there's a decay that's displaced from the primary vertex. And that got me into the silicon business, and I worked on that ever since and have been building bigger and bigger silicon detectors. And, you know, so, so part of, I think, what got me to where I am in, in the field was uh, a strong interest in, in, you know, going after major discoveries. Certainly wanted to go after the Higgs, look for the Higgs already in the 90s. But, you know, we really didn't have the accelerators we needed. And um, the LHC was the first real accelerator that would make that possible. Um, I, I joined the CMS experiment and helped them build the largest silicon detector ever built. We built 75 square meters of semiconductor detectors at Santa Barbara. Okay. And considering the entire world production before that was maybe five meters, that was a big jump. And then the whole system was 200. But that was crucial, and I think I played a big role in that, and that, that was crucial to our ability to do a lot of the kind of physics we were able to do at, um, at the LHC with the CMS experiment. And, and, uh, and, and I got into uh, the, the physics coordination and then the management of the team, and then I was uh, the spokesperson during the discovery of the Higgs. And since then, I'm still on, on the LHC. I'm still at CMS. We're now building a 700-square-meter silicon calorimeter, but I'm also using silicon and silicon calorimetry to look for dark matter with a 4 GeV and 8 GeV electron beam at, at Stanford. And so that's sort of my whole career in a nutshell. Yeah, that thing. was really amazing. Oh Thank my you. gosh. Yeah. Uh, well, um, lots of connection points in my mind that I'm thinking about. First of all, in high school, I remember uh, my friend Brian Goldhaber, now Brian Goldhaber uh, Gordon, at uh, at uh, Stanford, said that his grandfather looked for the monopole. So this this struggle to find the the magnetic monopole has been going on for a long time, and you yeah. were the one who killed it. <laughs> well, I killed one of them. I mean, it, you know, they looked originally for what they call just Dirac monopoles. They didn't know what the mass would be. They knew what the charge would have to be, and no one found them. And so it sort of petered out. The interest came again because. And in fact, it was really killed when when it was shown with grand unified theories that you didn't need monopoles to quantize electric charge, which was kind of one of the main motivations for them. <clears throat> but then uh, Gerard de Tuft showed that in all grand unified theories, there were monopole solutions, but they were very massive kind of gut monopoles. And so they were so massive, they would not have been detected by any of the previous experiments. And the only sure way to, one of the most sure ways, uh, one of the few sure ways was to use just their magnetic charge and detect the current in a superconducting loop. So when that was seen at Stanford, <clears throat> people got very excited that that was the new heavy, very heavy, massive um, monopole. Those are not entirely ruled out. It's ruled out that we would see them very easily on Earth. That's probably true, but we can't rule them out completely. And... Believe it or not, there could be just one in the universe. And, uh, <laughs> well, we, just met, we just met with Gerhard uh, yesterday. And oh, so, yeah, he, he was fantastic. And it was interesting to compare his feelings about uh, supersymmetry compared to Misha Schiffman, who we er uh, earlier interviewed. Misha, of course, was kind of sad that the LHC didn't find supersymmetry, and he was holding on to hope that a bigger uh, – Super Collider would would find it, um, and and Herhard was was more circumspect and said that, you know, just because a theory is beautiful doesn't mean it's true. No. True theories are beautiful, but it doesn't always work the other way around. So, what are your thoughts about supersymmetry since you spent so much time at the LHC? Yeah, and in fact, uh, one of the things I've been doing is searching for supersymmetry since, along with the Higgs, that was my main interest and in, and in probably. Ever since the Higgs was discovered, my main focus has been supersymmetry. And um, it, it looked, the, but I should say the reason I was interested in supersymmetry personally was not that it was such a beautiful theory or that it you know, was such a nice symmetry that it completed you know, this group of symmetries. Or There's many reasons to like supersymmetry, um, theoretically. It solves some very basic problems as well with the standard model, as you know. Uh, perhaps with the uh, <clears throat> gauge hierarchy problem, the 
you can't really easily explain why the Higgs mass is as low as it is, for example, without supersymmetry or something like that. So there are a lot of theoretical motiva motivations, but the reason I like to, when I focus my effort on ex something experimentally, which can be 10, 15 years of work, right? You have to have like lots of reasons to do it. So I needed something more than just theory, and I think it was dark matter, and the fact that supersymmetry predicted a candidate for dark matter. So uh, that's what I've been looking for, is that dark matter candidate at the LHC, and we have ruled out almost everything we could possibly look for, I mean, uh, in this simpler, more beautiful supersymmetry model. Now we're looking at less beautiful supersymmetry models, where the symmetries are broken a little bit, or you have you know, like a, the R parity is not perfect; it's partially violated, and things like this. So I like what I like to hear that Gerhard was saying what he did because I often say the same thing. You know, we have to be careful uh, not to be too much um, swayed by the beauty of the theory. We we have to go after practical things. And so dark matter, though, is really there. I mean, we know it's out there. We don't know what it is, and so uh, that's also why I'm looking. For instance, at this experiment at Stanford, it turns out that in the mass window between about where the electron mass is and the proton mass is, no one's ever really looked. It's dark matter. And supersymmetry would not necessarily predict it there unless you introduce a new force. But I found that very compelling because that's where the stable matter in the visible universe is, right? The electron, the lightest quarks, the proton. And, you know, nature likes to find reasons to do things, you know, in a symmetric way. And, now, and also above that, the LHC has ruled out a lot. There's a lot of other experiments. Dark detections have ruled out dark matter above that in many classes of models. Below that, cosmic microwave background has ruled out a lot. So there's this window that is pretty much untouched where stable, visible matter lives that nobody's looked, whereas we've looked to some extent everywhere else. So that window, I think, really has to be closed, and 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 I'm working on that now. And uh, and if but, you close that window, would you say it's safe to say that dark matter is what, like, just comets? You know, no, it could be. It, it could still be. It could still be uh, field like. It could be axions. Um, there's there are many things dark matter could be. The problem is. There's not, there's a wide, this, if you look at the spectrum of possibilities, it's something like 88 orders of magnitude, okay? We've ruled out maybe, I don't know, 10 orders of magnitude perhaps, or 20 or whatever. I can't, I can't do that off the top of my head, but we ruled out a fair amount, but there's a lot left. The problem is there, there's a, there's, there are wide ranges of, of dark matter that we would not be able to detect. So we're, we're, we're going after what we can at the moment. Um, we need stuff that would interact even very, very, very weakly with the standard model particles to see it, because we're, we, we're made of standard model particles. Um, if it's not detectable in that way, we may never be able to definitively say what it is. Um, so the hope is that we will find it with experiments like this. And, and there's a wide range of experiments going on right now. The fact that the LAC didn't find it actually opened up a huge array of new ideas for looking elsewhere. And uh, so there's, there's still some hope we'll find it. And when you find it, it doesn't necessarily resuscitate uh, supersymmetry, because as you said, supersymmetry yeah. wouldn't even predict the kind of dark matter you're looking for right now. Um, what do you think are the chances that supersymmetry will turn out to be true? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, th I think there's a good chance that the universe does make use of supersymmetry. It's for all the reasons I mentioned before, the theoretical reasons, it's, it's very troubling if you don't have something like that to explain, for instance, the gauge hierarchy problem. I mean, you could argue that maybe this is, uh, there's a multiverse, this is the anthropic universe and so forth. That may be the truth, but I like to say as an experimentalist, that's not something I can test. And um, so it's kind of irrelevant to me at the moment. We have to rule everything else out first. But, um, you know, supersymmetry may be part of the universe in a way that we can't ever detect. And um, 
you know, supersymmetry is not a fixed theory, right? It's a parameter space that's incredibly broad. And, and you know, there's even many classes of supersymmetry that we haven't even begun to study. It's a symmetry. That's what it is. And so the universe may use that symmetry, but doesn't mean we have, it has to do it in a way that we detect it, you know? And, and even if you never detect it, don't you think that it has provided a lot of good, helpful ways of seeing the universe that have led to good real discoveries since the 1970s? I mean, absolutely. It's yeah. driven a lot of great thinking and uh, methodology, both experimentally and theor theoretically. Um, and it's used a lot, as you probably know, in there's something called the ADS CFT theorem, which you know, it uses super, super symmetry, uh, super symmetric uh, Yang Mills theories. And, and, and there's a lot of work going on with super symmetric theories theoretically that are more tractable. You'd have to talk to a theorist to get this straight, of course, but you know, there's, it, it's a great model for understanding just some of the, me, you know, the methods and me mechanics and, and, and what universes could be. And I think, it's helped drive a lot of major uh, breakthroughs in our understanding of, the, of, you know, fundamental theories, sort of the, but we're a long way away, I think from, I think we're, we're, we're still probably a century away from where th theoretical physics needs, needs to get to really start answering some of these questions, perhaps with string theory and things like this. It's a, this has happened before, you know, where it takes time to develop the mathematics and really understand things. Yeah. And, and, Gerhard was saying that uh, string theory depends even more on supersymmetry than some of the other ways of explaining the universe. Is that is that how it works? That if the if if supersymmetry never finds confirmation in any of our experiments, and the string theorists are going to be kind of scratching their heads, is that how it works? No. Well, that's an interesting point. I think I don't want to contradict you know, a Nobel Prize winning theorist about theoretical physics. But, you know, and I have Gerhard, well, we spent some time together uh, traveling and lecturing at one point. Um, and he has, he's, he's brilliant and he's also very good at kind of probing the tough questions and looking at things from all sides. But I, I would say from my limited understanding, I mean, certainly supersymmetry for the most part requires uh, I mean, string theory requires supersymmetric, uh, or it has supersymmetry in the solution most of the time. Not all cases, okay? I think there are classes of string theory that don't require supersymmetry, that's my understanding, but most does. And, 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 you know, and it could be that if we never find supersymmetry that, you know, that makes some people doubt a little bit string theory. But there's another way to flip that around. What if string theory develops to the point where it makes predictions that we can confirm in other ways. For instance, we don't know why the masses of the particles are what they are. What, what determines the Yukawa couplings? Suppose string theory at some point can predict that. I don't know. Or, or can predict other parameters of the, sta of the standard model. And at the same time says there has to be supersymmetry. That might be a reason to believe there is supersymmetry. And it might be able to explain why we don't find it. Right? So I, I, I think, you know, we, until we, I think there's a long way to go on these things. <laughs> And I think a, a century is probably about right. I mean, who knows? Uh, somebody right. really smart could come come along tomorrow. But uh, yeah, I don't think it's something that we have to rush because there's so much left to know. Do you ever feel like Indiana Jones looking for archaeological uh, entities when you're looking for these top quarks and monopoles and things like that? Do you feel like a real, like, I'm going to find this thing. It's got to be here somewhere. Yeah, I think I think you do feel that, especially when it takes a long time. You start really getting an intimate, you know, sort of connection with what you're chasing. But I think the more the more incredible thing is when you see these things. So for the top court discovery in particular, um, that was my you know the first big discovery I was involved in, and we did a blind search, blind analysis, and we got permission to open the box, and there were like a handful of us. And you open this, you know, you look at the distribution and you say, oh my God, it's there, you know? And it's hard to convey what that feels like. You're looking at something that, you know, really is a characteristic of, of the universe, right? This is part of space time. It's something that hasn't been, you know, produced 
copiously in the universe since the Big Bang and you're seeing this thing and it's a pretty amazing feeling to, wow. to, to, to be part of that, but it's, uh, it's pretty rare and it's slow. Our research in particular is very slow. I like to tell people, think of a glacier and then slow it down. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's depressing, but it's still exciting. I mean, you know, again, with the Indiana Jones analogy, you know, Indiana Jones's dad was looking for the Holy Grail his whole life, you know, writing right. down in his little notebook and finally got to see it. So I bet that must I have like 15 or 20 logbooks just, you know, going yeah. back years and all the studies and preparations and ideas and and many of us in the field are like that, but it is it is hard. We're we're in a field where it's you know it's getting very hard to 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 make further progress. You can see the size of the machines we need. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, with dark matter, we can get by with much smaller experiments now and find it. And that would be that that might give us clues also about supersymmetry. By the way, it yeah. has been such a pleasure to have you here and to hear your story. It's, well, thanks. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been yes. a pleasure.